Hello and welcome to a weekly Parsha Shiva, the commentary of the Answer HaKadosh. It's Parsha Shmini. Um, and uh, this shear is uh, dedicated for Rafael Chai Ben Sara to have a Rafael Shalema. Uh, looking a bit dark in here tonight. Ooh, okay, that will have to be the way it is. I hope you don't mind. So the, the Parsha Shmini is so jam packed full. Can I tell you that we've already covered Shmini in uh, the first season's uh, shear? Uh, this is uh, our opportunity to take it in a slightly different direction. Uh, if you remember back in Parsha's Tav uh, last week, we talked about how that the, the Parsha starts off talking in the in the singular, Odom ki yakri, the man who offers a sacrifice, and then it swaps to the plural, Korban Echem. The Alshuk there said that the whole point was that if it is the case that God forgives one individual who makes a mistake, you might think it's because it's an individual. Whereas if the entire Jewish people make mistakes um, or make a, a mistake, a national mistake, effectively stop believing themselves as Jews, then that would be unforgivable. But the point is, of course, that both are forgivable by Hashem. And the Gomorrah and Shabbos discusses the very interesting uh, uh, insight into this, pointing out that neither the Jewish people, when they made the golden calf, where the Hebrews royal Isamaisa were worthy, worthy is the wrong word, um, deserved, perhaps would be a good word, to have done that. They weren't so bad that they would have done that. They weren't bad at all. Uh, and nor Dovid and Melech, in the famous story of Dovid and Bathsheba, uh, which even today the world knows of Dovid's adultery, it wasn't adultery, um, then why did he do it? Because Hashem protects Tzadikim, it says. And if the, if the Jewish people at the Golden Calf were in such a high spiritual level that they were really reca recapturing the, the moment or the level of the Rishon, they were Tzadikim. Why didn't God protect them then? Why didn't God protect Dovid and from the story of Ben Shem? In fact, because I'll tend to say that he actually made it happen. He manipulated the, the, the events. And the Gwaris is a very interesting thing. And that is... Both events were allowed to take place in order that there should be paradigms, there should be examples for all future generations. But if it is the case that a, an individual Jew makes a mistake, makes, does an avera, does a sin, which is at, to such a level that it becomes a chil Hashem, which is the, the worst form of sin, and there was no greater chil Hashem, in the eyes of the world anyway, the Dovid Melech and Bathsheba, then still there's a way back from that. If it is the case that the Jewish people have done something which is collectively so bad that the world will, will turn around and say, ah, that's it, God's finished with them, as Christianity argued, as Islam argues, Christianity argues, I should say, Islam argues, etc. theologically speaking, uh, then you're supposed to turn around and say, no, God's never going to let us go. After the golden calf, he forgave us for that. He does forgive us when we get it wrong. Okay, so basically, uh, the, the, corbo, the, the, very, the corbonus, the sacrifices of the Mishkan, and the Mishkan itself is um, the, the, the whole structure, the dimensions, the materials used to build it are all in, interconnect uh, with the human experience and have messages for the human experience. In that particular case, the message for the human experience is that the forgiveness in, in both the national and the, and the individual scale. Fine. Um, I can't remember last week if I told you, um, maybe I'll tell you a story. Uh, my first ever lecture tour to Cape Town, I used to go to South Africa quite frequently to, to say sure, like it very much, like the people very much. I was in Cape Town. The rabbi of it was called oh I forgot the name of the shul now, um, but the 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 shul was just at the foot of Table Mountain, looking out the window, you could see the beautiful Table Mountain of Cape Town, um, and basically I nearly had it there. It was in the tip of my tongue. Uh, we met briefly from one of my uh, other lecturers. We liked each other. I can even tell his name, Rabbi Doctor Ivan Lerner, who became and to this day is still one of my closest and dearest friends. Um, when he wanted to bring me for a whole week to lecture at a program he ran straight after Sukkot, an educational program. Today, there's in South Africa, the chief rabbi set up something called the Sinai in Dava, uh, which I had the great honor of addressing about four years ago, five years ago. 
Um, and this was a, a predecessor of that. Uh, so, of course, in all these trips, you, you send a, uh, a biography um, so that this publicity can be generated, pictures, biographies. So this was sent to, to there. Now, my old biography uh, used to say that four years ago, the independent newspaper in the UK, which is a, a large newspaper in the UK, um, probably the equivalent of the New York Times here in America, uh, stated, cited, cited, um, Rabbi Waimai as being amongst one of five people to turn to for advice, um, along with Tony Blair's mentor. So they did a piece called Mentors, and of course this was, it was, they were just looking for five interesting people. Well, that sounds worse, I'm trying to be modest here. Uh, five uh, people to cite as people who give advice. And so there was a, a Roman Catholic priest who was, who was and perhaps still is Tony Blair's mentor. And it was me with my work with university students. So I was amongst five people. They said were five, the five people in the UK to go to for advice. So I said this all. It makes for good, it makes for good publicity. Uh, and huge posters went up all around Cape Town telling people to come in here, Rabbi YY, um, Tony Blair's mentor. And that's not what it said. It's not what I said. I said it was cited along with Tony Blair's mentor as being one of five people in the UK to turn to for advice. Well, these posters were not everywhere. And when I saw them, I said to my, my host, my good friend, what? This is, you can't, you've got to take these down. You know, nobody will pay any attention to it. And nobody did pay any attention to it until the very last session, which was a master rabbi session. And halfway through it, a fellow, stick, a South African fellow, a little fellow, remember distinctly, the second or third row stuck up his hand and said in a South African accent, Rabbi, R-A-B-B-A, -B -B -A, Rabbi. Uh, what's Tony Blair like? What's Tony Blair like? How would I know? Uh, the problem was I now had been publicized as his mentor and I had to get out of this without lying. This is tricky. I said, well, I can honestly tell you that I've never ever found or seen anything in Tony Blair that I personally disliked. And it, and everybody seemed to be happy with that. And I breathed a sigh of relief, looked at my host, Rabbi Lerner, um, and uh, he looked at me with a big smile. He smiles a lot. Uh, and then the guy, the little guy, stuck his hand up a second time. I was starting to dislike him. Rabbi, does Tony Blair phone you or do you phone Tony Blair? No, at that point, I really did dislike the fellow. So I quickly said, uh, well, it's always a good idea to wait for the Prime Minister of the, of the UK to pick up the phone to you. And again, that seemed to go down with the audience. And I was off the hook and he put his hand up a third time. No, I, I hated him at this stage. I said, Rabbi, I would like you to tell Tony Blair the next time you're speaking to him, that if they expand the Security Council of the United Nations, South Africa should not represent the whole of Africa. And I assured him with absolute sincerity that the next time I was scheduled to speak to Tony Blair, I would try my very best to bring that subject up. And he seemed quite happy. So there you are. The reason I tell you this is because Jordan, Jonathan Sachs, I think I mentioned this last week, can't remember, Lord Jonathan Sachs, love to him. He said um, he used to give a shear uh, once a month in 10 Downing Street. Yes, I did tell you this last week, 10 Downing Street to Tony Blair. And after that, Gordon Brown, his successor, used to give the same share to him. They're both religious men. Um, and the, the, the whole point was in the story, if you remember from, the, uh, from last week, that he, when Tony Blair saw this, he used to say, ah, when we got to the cedars we were looking at in Vayikra, Leviticus, he used to say, ah, the boring bit of the Bible. But that's only because he, didn't, he doesn't know Hebrew. Uh, he can't analyze the language uh, of the Bible in Hebrew, dictated by God, uh, no mistakes, therefore. And he certainly can't look at it through the eyes of the al -Shikh. So that's what we're going to do again tonight. Now the al -Shikh, here, let's just remind yourself what we're talking about. Um, so it's Parsha Shmini and it says, I've got my trusty little art scroll on the chair. But he be on the in the eighth day, Koram Moshele, Aaron the Bonav, from Zygni Israel. Moshele calls to Aaron and to his sons and to the Zygni Israel. Beyond all, Aaron says, Aaron Kakelho, Kakelho, Ego ben Bokor Lechatois. Take for yourself an eagle, a calf, which is a ben bokor from the from the from the cattle, from the, uh, I was gonna say flocks, it's not herd, that's the word. Lachatos to be a chatos. Chatos is a sin offering. The Ayala oila and a ram to be the oila. Now we talked about the oila last week in the last week's parsha and sav, to be the um 
all of the more that Leah, all that let's see. And the sin, let's only say, and she the first year to be an elevation offering, going up. Okay, um, to me, it's got to be perfect. Hakrev and the Hashem, and you will offer it before God. Aaron shall offer that those two sacrifices before God. So for the, uh, let's remind ourselves again, uh, it is for uh, an eagle Ben Bocker is to be a chatos. I was flashing outside, we got a thunderstorm coming. This might be more exciting than normally. Um, but Isle of Oila, an, an Isle of Ram for an Oila. But interestingly, in the next passage, when he's talking to the Jewish people, it says, the Albanese Israel, to Dabas Neymar, Kahu Seir Izim, take Seir Izim, he goes, a chatos to be a, to be a chatos. About eagle, the kevus, an eagle and a sheep, ben a one year old, to me, oila, to be an oila. And the Alshir points out here that it's strange when it comes to the chatos. In Aaron's case, the chatos is to be, so let me read that again. And the chatos, remember, is something you're all, it's for an unintentional sin. So what's he got to bring is an eagle. So he's got to bring a calf to being a, 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 a chatos for an, un, a, an unintentional sin. For the Jewish people, uh, then it is a, if I can just read to you again, um, go for the oiler, then the eagle, the calf is for the oiler, the elevation offering. So the answer's question is, why does it change? Why is for Aaron, at the chatos, the sin offering for an unintentional sin, it is the eagle, uh, a calf, but the calf is the oiler for the Jewish people. That's the question. Now, I'm not sure if that would be so apparent a, it, would not, it would emerge so apparently as a question if we read it in the English, it would be so noticeable. It certainly leaps from the page when it comes to when it comes to the Hebrews. So I'm going to close that for a second, and uh, and we're going to come back to what the Alshik has to say about very shortly. But uh, let's uh, move on a little bit, and I want to tell you what something one of my great heroes, one of my favorite sorim, is Das Chochma Musser of Rabbi Rucham, the famous Meshkiach of Mir. And I was learning this with my, my very dear friend and Chobrusa, Naftali Rakov, who's the son of my Rov, the gates of Rov. His father was Rabbi Tzal Rakov, was my Rov. And we were learning this for about a third of the way through volume one of the Sefer, three volumes. We'll be learning this for a while. And uh, here he has uh, an essay. This is SE 41, or if you like pages, and you have the Sefer home, Kufkov Aleph. Um, that's the title of the of the of the essay, and that's a little bit uh, perplexing as to exactly how to translate that. But I'll just read it to you because he goes straight in to quote the Medrash. But that this this uh, 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 chapter heading comes from. So he says the Medrash Rabba Shmo Shmois Rabba in the Medrash Rabba Shmois Rabba is in Chapter Lamed Hey. If you're interested, it's Medrash Vav. Doesn't say that, but I looked it up before our Shir. It says the following thing: Dobrecha, but this is as a Karoshim at the Mishkan. It's talking about making the boards of the boards for the Mishkan. That's it's focused on that. Of course, the boards are made of wood, and the the whole sides of the Mishkan, the walls of the Mishkan, were constructed from boards that slatted into place. But um, and at that point, so that's just the possible we're talking about, which leads the, the Gomorrah to say the following, uh, 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 the major story to offer, offer the following uh, interesting statement. Omer of Abin, Rav Abin says, Moshul Lamelech, this commandment to make the Mishkan using wooden boards, it's a bit like a king, that had a beautiful portrait of himself. Maybe painted by a Michelangelo or, or somebody, you know, very talented, brilliant artist. Um, so he had this portrait. Omar le Ben Besa, he said to his son, to, to, to his son um, also Lee Kamoisa, make me a copy of that. I want you to replicate one of them for me. Re -re replicate this portrait for me. Make, me. make me a copy of this portrait. Omar le, uh, to which, now the, here it doesn't actually uh, say this. Um, it's missed out that the son said, how can I possibly do that? I'm not a, I'm not a Michelangelo. Uh, perhaps he wasn't, maybe he could only do stick figures, a little box and a stick figure inside. Um, or yeah, it's certainly not going to be like this beautiful work masterpiece of the, of, of the king. To which he says the following thing. Omelie, so the king says to him, you with your uh, art implements, 
you do the best job you can. Um, and, and I will be the way I am. And my, my masterpiece will stay on the wall, sort of thing. That's what the king says. That's what Hashem said to Moshe. Look and see into heaven. See the Mishkan there. And you make one down here that's like it. Okay. Um, How can I possibly make the Moshe was almost identical to the Nimshel. How can I possibly make something down here which is an equivalent to where you dwell in heaven, your heavenly palace? Um, to which he says to him, right, uh, just make it as best you can. Um, you should make it with, with, with blues and purples and, and all the ingredients of the um, of the of the Mish uh, that he saw when he looked at the sky, that's how he's going to make the Mishkan down here. And of course, the Mishkan was made with all those ingredients, the gold, the copper, etc., etc. Um, so I'll read a little bit more to him. Um, but tell this, Shani, because Shem Atta Roy Lamala, and just like you see the, the Mishkan, because you're a prophet, and you can look up, look up Moshe and see into heaven, the vision that you see there, the Kach, Asa, Lamata, that's what you should make down there as well. Shalema says, Atsi Shitim, the Aindim, um, that he made the the walls, the wooden walls, because that's what it looked like in heaven. Um, okay. And if you make it like that, I'll be able to allow the assembly of the angels who are up there to come and descend and live down there. So you've just got to make a so they so they feel at home, right? Just you may have noticed Lubavitch. If you ever been to to New York where I live, and you go to Seven Seventy, um, uh, which of course is the center of Lubavitch uh, in the world, and it's a very distinctly, very huge and very distinct uh, house where the Rebbe used to live, used to live, and that's the center of Lubavitch Casinos. Um, and there are Lubavitch centers all around the world, Los Angeles and Yerushalayim, which replicate. Uh, as closely as possible, the original 770 in dimensions and shape, and even in the bricks. Um, so basically, as it were, you could, it would continue the message of the original with the Rebbe's there, when the Rebbe was there, and it will continue in all these centers throughout the world. So he says, um, and if you make a, 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 the thing you see upstairs, then, 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 uh, I'll make my assembly, my, my heavenly court, the angels, and I'll be able to show Malo, and they'll be able to dwell on, on, on earth below. So uh, I am the, apparently the walls are seraphim, seraphs. I don't know what a seraph is, some sort of angel. Um, I mean, you see pictures of it. You've seen the original one. Um, just like downstairs, uh, here you can see the stars in heaven. That means to say the clasps, the golden clasps that were used uh, in, the, in the Mishkan, etc. Um, they looked like, looking up, they looked like like uh, golden, uh, like star, stars in the sky. That's as it is, uh, the Mishkan. The mice of the making of the Mishkan would be a, a copy of the one in heaven. Yerushal, the Karoshav, the Adonav, and it goes through all the all the various aspects of the of the Mishkan. So what you saw upstairs and heaven, make it downstairs as well, down and uh, on earth. And if they he is side a shrash shkina, and that is how you'll have the shkina to be able to dwell on earth. And the shkina does the presence of God in this week's parsha comes and appears and dwells on earth because we've got a 770 replica um, down here, but it's not a replica of the of the Mishkan of the Mishkan and Shemaim, where Hashem is situated, whatever that means. And all these terms are nonsense anyway. Situation assumes physical space, geography, and that doesn't apply to God. Anyway, the Ain of the that, that's all that is the, the Medrash. Now, says Rabbi Ruha, you can almost hear him rolling his eyes. 
see him rolling his eyes. I'm sorry. Vein a macavan should be aimed as tabnets of Michigan diamond and Matim Lama. And don't think for one millisecond that everything I've told you means that you to take this literally and that somehow or other the the what Moisha saw when he's looking prophetically beyond the physical existence, the physical realities of our world, to a place where none of these physical realities uh, exist, that he was able to take those non-earthly, non-physical realities and transplant them into a physical world. They would not fit. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Key, I just who amida at zishiti. That it's obvious to take one example that these wooden uh, boards, which rep which were the the walls of the Mishkan, amida gashmoim, physical materials, wood, sheba masugenu doimel amida sedrafim, that they are going to look like rows of angel type creatures that apparently Hashem sits amongst. It's nonsense. This is so well, I don't know what a seraph or an angel looks like. I've got no conception of what they are. But they're not wooden boards. Uh, well, they're some sort of living, sentient beings. It's not even that they don't even look like them. There was no way to, to copy them in any way whatsoever. But, but by making asishitim uh, acacia woods, boards of acacia wood, pillars of acacia, acacia wood. Forget him is beach, or how about Ms. Beach? So Moshe looks up at heaven, he sees a Ms. Beach. And therefore, all oh, right, there's a Ms. Beach up there, we're gonna have one down here. What does that mean? Do you really think that the Ms. Beach that you see in the uh, in the altar in the in the Mishkan? The, the altar, that was the same as the one upstairs? Physical, a physical space occupied by a physical thing? What nonsense! By him, Ravua Gashmi Shalom Zbech, and the squareness um, of, the, of the shape, of the dimension of this particular piece of furniture in the Mizbech, Shalomata down here on earth, who tongue this Mizbech Shalomalo, that somehow uh, uh, approximates to the, the Mizbech of heaven, total nonsense. The Ken Ha'im Yesh Betechelos Yosef Zagula, or it's got to have Techelos, right? It's got to have blue. Blue is a color that has to be there. Do you really think color? Color only relates to our eyes and the spectrum that we see light as human beings, right? Not, uh, there are plenty of animals that are colorblind. And what about heaven? You think there's color there? You think there are photons? Of, of light uh, bouncing on retinas and sending signals back to brains. Color only exists in this world. I mean, color. Make it purple and blue, as the Shemedris said, Hashem said to Moshe. Blue? Because you see up here purple and blue? Just, just copy the purple and blue that you see here. What purple and blue? Um, sorry, but the Yosef's and somehow the, the blue that you're going to see is going to remind you of the of the Almighty and, and him dwelling on earth. But Allah Posh move into a call she in here at Bain to hear us the shards of him. It's obvious to anybody with half a brain cell, there's no difference to the one color and the other. How does that relate to heaven? Shakulam in Rak Masogamigashmai. Because colors are only things that apply in this world if you've got eyeballs that can interpret them and, and see them as being different. And having said all that, he then says, therefore from this you understand quite clearly the whole fundamental concept of the Mishkan is inin ha-mishkan hu rak ata basam menecha v'ani b'kvik. Just like this marshal of the king who said to his son, you do your best. I want you to copy that. Copy that portrait. How can I copy that portrait? It's ridiculous. I can only do stick figures. You do your best. With the tools that you've got, with the tools that you possessed, or you possess, then you do your best. That will, that will be good enough for me. Mm -hmm. Let me read on. Because then we're moving into, I think, a beautiful territory. It's not Kabbalistic, and that's what ultimately is Kabbalistic. Um, but it's, it's, to my mind, irresistible. The logic's irresistible. 
if we therefore bear in mind everything that we just explained, this idea of you've got to do your best to approximate to what, what, what's in heaven, but Maisa Mishkan Hineda Be'emes, the Kol Maisa Mishkan, the truth of the matter is that it applies to all mitzvahs. For example, but tzitzis. When it comes to tzitzis, what does it say? Omer Amir, man, yishtana tachedas mekol mini tzitzis. So why is blue so different and so much, uh, much more a valuable color than any other color? Shah tachedas daim l'rakia, because the truth is that blue is like heaven. V'rakia daim l'rakia kovet, and that reminds you of God's throne sitting in heaven. Shanema says, V'yeras Hashem l'rakia Yisrael, because if you were to look, you would see that really it is it's kisya kovet. It's it's like blue. Aha. Where Isim was a kantam, and you remember, and and you will see it, and you remember. Amara maybe the days the corn, so that seeing something triggers an association, a memory. Um, the corn maybe the day Maisa. And the memory and association leads you to action, leads you to doing things. Begilona Chazal, that's going to be important for about in a minute. Begilona Chazal, because I'll say, Soid Chuti Atzitz is to seal the Kedas down the Kisa Kovit. But the string is, is a bit like the Kisa Kovit. A piece of wool string is like the Kisa Kovit, God's throne in heaven. What nonsense is this? This is worse than the. Than the, the 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 previous thing of making a mishkan that's somehow going to approximate to the, the one in heaven. No, what it means is like this. Uh, but it's telling what you're supposed to how you're supposed to relate to mitzvahs. Is blue really in some way relatable? To the reality of what God's throne looks like, whatever that means. Is it in some way going to approximate to the Kisya Kovet, to God's throne? If that's the only way you can relate to it, then that's the job that it does. Like the, 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 the king who said to, the, to his son, the prince, take your, your painting set and do your best. You'll do your best. But it's going, be, it's going to be ridiculous compared to the, the, the masterpiece that uh, Michelangelo would have painted, uh, the, the portrait of the king. But that, as long as it allows you still, the, the kid, if that stick figure allows him to think of his dad, that'll do it. If this, all the aspects of the Mishkan will allow you to think of Hashem and the Mishkan and the Mishkan and Shalim, all of those aspects allows you to relate to heaven and allows heaven to relate to you, then it does that has done its job. And as we said before, that every single aspect of the Mishkan, the the, the, fa- the, the, the materials, the dimensions, the fabrics, the colors, etc., are all, and of course the sacrifices that are, are offered there, are all there in order and for a connection to us, the way that we can see it, the way that we can relate to it. You do your best. You can't actually ultimately understand how all this stuff works throughout all the dimensions of creation for the world of the angels and we talked about last week the world of the planets and of course ultimately where Hashem dwells himself but it does work there is a connection even though it's as crude as a stick figure um, compared to a Michelangelo masterpiece and that takes us back with that idea that everything in the Mishkan has a relative a relationship um, and a relativity to the, the everyday existence of people like you and I. It's just you have to be able to work out the dimensions and the ideas and see what that connection is. And the example of the Alshik mentions before, but of course there is only one time in a person's life you're guaranteed to be forgiven for anything you did wrong, and that's when you get married. Hashem's wedding gift to any Hosnin Kala under the chuppah is I'll wait, wipe, wipe the slate clean for everything you've done wrong. The, uh, the gift is hinted at uh, when it comes to the, the furniture of the base of Mikdash. All of it relates to some aspect of real human existence as we can relate to it. Um, and that is, so it's like, the Michigan then becomes like an aid, a large aid memoir, a large prompt to prompt you to remember things. So the, 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 um, 
the uh, Oren, the the I'm trying to think of the English word of Oren is the box, um, in which the the luchot or luchos are contained, um, has a lid. The lid is called the kaporis. Why is it called the kaporis? Same word as keeper to atone. It atones for things that you've done wrong when when you get married. The symbolism of the lid is marriage. No. That symbolism carries through. We've done this before. Let me just remind you. It's two and a half amas in length. Now that's an ama. From there to there is an ama. And it's all the measurements, uh, the Jewish measurements are all based on the and the span or the, the elements of a person's body. And many uh, metrics are based on the human body. So there are six fists in, we've done this, right? if you've been, to, well, if you've not been to the previous year, you won't know. You, uh, it's anyway, one, two, three, four, five. You can't even get to six when you get down there. So therefore, if it's if one ama is six tfokim, that means two and a half amas, it's 15 tfokim in length. So that was the, the length. So you get an idea of how that's two and a half amas there. So there and over there. Sorry, wiggles. Well, that's my left arm. Um, so that black line of the of the swarm shelf over there, that's, that was about the length of the of the orange, so it wasn't huge. Uh, oh, its width is is one and a half, so that's nine fachim. So, what's the symbolism of that? So you probably know that the Hebrew word for a man is an ish, and the woman is isha. Um, if you take out the one letter from each, you're left with two letters which are the same: aleph shin, aleph shin, ish, which means fire. And put in the yud makes it into ish, man, and put in the hay in, at the end of the the Aleph Shin and the woman, it turns Isha. Uh, take those out, you've got yud Hey, which is 15. And yud Hey is also one of God's names. The message is, in the dimensions, that if you base your marriage, remember the lid symbolizes the marriage, on the box in which the Torah is given, the, the Luchot were given, base your marriage on the Torah, then you will have, uh, running through the length of the marriage, uh, the length of the marriage, because that's you'll have God running through the length of your marriage. The yud he, symbolizing God, running that's the length of the box, because the, the lid of the box, the lid on the box in which the Torah a, is contained. The width, that's nine. That's very interesting. In the in the Torah, in the Torah, in the beginning of the Torah, it says that Od Hashem created Adam Arishan, and the Chava it says the Korah Shamom Adam. He called their name. Adam, Adam, uh, if you're good at uh, gematrias, the, the numerical values of Hebrew letters, Aleph is obviously one, uh, or Dom, Dalit is four, it's five, uh, and then we've got Mem, which is 40, but we're doing what, what's called Misparkot, you just hit the first value, and that would be four, which to give us nine, 40, knock off the zero, you left with four. So that's nine. Nine? So it's nine Adam. Kor Shemam Adam, you call their name, the width of the box is they will become as one. Their name, Kor Shemam Adam, they will become like one, nine. Um, and there's a beautiful story everybody knows for Barry Levine, the great tzaddik of Yerushalayim, who once went to the doctor, because it was with his wife who had hurt her foot. And the doctor was so excited to see the great tzaddik in surgery in his office said, oh, Rebari, how can I help you? He said, no, it's not me, it's my wife. My wife's foot hurts us hearts us hmm. become one Korah Shemam called their name Odom, one thing and then on top of the box you get two cherubs and the two cherubs are have a boy's face and a girl's face and they're made of pure gold and the idea is that if you, if you build your, 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 your marriage, the lid I, I, on a basis of Torah but you'll have a Shem running through the length of it you'll become like one person and you'll be Zoika, you'll merit to have um, uh, a little boy and a little girl, which of course fulfills the myths of Puru having children. Nice, beautiful idea. Um, but it's all symbol symbolically, in, the idea is imparted through a part of the structure of the Mishkan. And that is the lid on top of the on top of the of the Oran. And that applies to all of these things. So when it comes to the sacrifices here, our question was at the beginning here, why is it that when it comes to, uh, to Aaron and Cohen, when it comes to him offering, where does he offer a calf? He offers a calf as a chatos. The Jewish people, when it comes, where, where's their calf? That's for an oiler. 
what's the difference between the two? So as I said before, the Alshik says, in answering this question, you've got to realize that the whole process of Kapora applies here too. The whole process of reconnection, the Mishkan is there to allow us to reconnect to God. It's the plan B. We weren't supposed to need that had we not made the golden calf. This is the, God would speak to us directly. We wouldn't have needed a Mishkan, but now we've got a Mishkan. Then this is how we're going to connect to God again. And how are you going to connect to God? Well, it's symbolized through this idea of a place where you offer sacrifices, the word sacrifice, carbon, coming close to God. And the way, the, the, the idea of the, of the Kurbanus symbolizes how you come close to God. And the Alshak says that you have to realize when you've done something wrong, that it's, you've got to make sure that in putting it right, you give yourself the right medicine that cures the, the, the problem that caused the illness in the first place. That's just logical. Therefore, as the, the sacrifice that are being offered by the Jewish people, because the Mishkan is their forgiveness for making the golden calf, the eagle is of, in Aaron's case, his, particip again, his participation in making the golden calf was accidental. Oh yes, he made a golden calf. It was a stalling exercise until Moshe came back. The fact that the Khartoumi Mitzrayim, the Egyptian magicians who came out with the air of Rav, the mixed multitude of the Jewish people, they, through their hocus pocus black magic, which was a reality, did have power, were able to animate it and make it walk, this gold statue walk out of the flames, which led to them believing that this was some sort of, you know, uh, divine thing. And, and eventually devolved into Avoid Azura. He didn't anticipate that. A strategy to stall them and allow Moshe the chance to come back and, and disprove the claims that he died, that was perfectly respectable, but he didn't know what was going to happen. He had no way of anticipating that one. That Therefore, his sin there is a chat, is unintentional. So therefore, in atoning for that, because the mission is there to atone for that, his personal part in saying sorry for his a, his a role in the in the golden calf, he'll bring a an eagle, a calf, an ordinary calf as a sacrifice to atone for the golden calf, but it's a chatos because he wasn't intentional. The Jewish people bring a calf as well, but there it's it's an oila and an oila. If you remember from last week's center, is when you intention in your heart you intend to do something bad. They intended to do something bad. So you need a different sort of sacrifice. The sacrifice has to fit. The punishment has to fit the crime. The securing the way out of prison has to be appropriate. The person has to show that they've repented properly. They've sorted themselves out and it has to match. So if my crime was an unintentional crime, I apologize for, I don't know, I didn't think hard enough on it. If I did do it intentionally wrong, then I need a different type of sacrifice. A sacrifice, a iscarbus. You know the sacrifice word is? Corbin, coming close to God. It needs a different type of Corbin, a more intense type of closeness to God if my sin was intentional to when it was not non-intentional. That's all in the Hebrew. Tony Blair would have missed that. Another insight into how the Mishkan plays its role in connecting us to heaven because we can't understand heaven. So it's a bit like if I was saying to a son, you copy it as best you can. You get an idea, and then we'll build it up from there. I wish you all a very good job. I look forward to seeing you next week when we continue looking at the Parshas, the commentary of the Al-Shirk Good job.